Thanks, everybody. Thanks for spending the next half hour with us. So we're going to be talking about machine learning, which is a, a vast topic. So to be clear, we're going to be talking about it specifically in relation to ArcGIS and the opportunities to use these kinds of approaches uh, within the ArcGIS platform. We'll have a, a very brief um, discussion around what we mean by machine learning in this context, and then we're going to look at some examples of machine learning expressed in both existing capabilities and brand, brand new capabilities. Um, so I hope you find it um, an interesting session. Let's start with this uh, brief look at the definition. And I, I put this slide up because I, I don't profess to be a machine learning expert by any means. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm learning as I go, especially in relation to how uh, I can leverage these capabilities from a spatial perspective. But I often see this kind of breadth of terminology in press articles I read, in, in feeds and so on. And it's a real mixture of concepts, bits of software that actually implement machine learning techniques, and specific approaches to machine learning. So examples would be machine learning as an overall concept, a random forest as an approach to uh, machine learning, and then TensorFlow as a means of implementing uh, and training models in an actual software framework. And these things, I think, often get kind of interchanged and used in rather a confusing way. So our simplistic definition of the terminology is AI being computers engaged in tasks that you normally associate as requiring some level of human intelligence. Machine learning being under that umbrella term, um, being those kinds of techniques, but using data-driven algorithms to discover patterns and opportunities for analytics. And then deep learning being a specific expression of machine learning that uses convolutional neural networks uh, to tackle this kind of analysis, uh, somewhat loosely resembling the way the human brain would do this. And if you think about it as that sort of hierarchy, that shell-like view of it, it starts to make a bit more sense when you plug in some of those terms that we saw on the first slide back in there. Um, so when we're talking about machine learning, we're talking about this expression of AI uh, as manifest inside of ArcGIS. But this isn't necessarily brand new, and clearly machine learning is not something that Esri invented. Um, we'll show you examples of machine learning that are evident in existing geoprocessing tools in ArcGIS that you could use today, as well as what Hutan is going to show you is reaching out into some of the more popular um, scientific open frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow to actually get work done that you wouldn't have been able to do solely in ArcGIS and previously would have been pretty hard to jump out and do it in isolation in those frameworks. What you'll find current evidence machine learning, as I say, is in geoprocessing tools, and I'm going to show you a couple examples of those. But let's kick off with Hutan, who's going to talk about prediction as an expression of machine learning. Thanks, Josh. So the whole concept of prediction in machine learning is all about using the known to estimate or predict the unknown. It's about using a limited set of known values to establish a pattern in one location and then using that pattern to predict values in other locations, or even predict values in the future. Now, before we start talking about specific machine learning techniques, we should get an understanding of the typical machine learning workflow when it comes to the world of ArcGIS. There are three main components to this workflow. Part one is typically done in ArcGIS Pro. This is where our GIS professional will be using ArcGIS Pro to generate training samples for export into the next phase. Part two is typically done outside of ArcGIS in a Python environment. This is where our data scientist will be taking those training samples that were created earlier and using a deep learning framework like TensorFlow in conjunction with a, um, a machine learning technique like Random Forest to generate a model definition for use in the final part. Now, defining that model is usually the most technically intensive and the most complex portion of the entire process. Finally, we reach part three, which is typically done back inside of an ArcGIS environment, usually, usually in ArcGIS Pro or even in ArcGIS Enterprise. And this is where our GIS professional will be taking the model definition created before and using the inferencing tools within ArcGIS 
to output the predicted results. All right, let's do a demo. So for this demonstration, we're gonna be using known seagrass habitats around the continental United States to predict where seagrass is likely to grow worldwide, including around the coast of Australia. Now, why do we care about seagrass? Well, seagrass is an important habitat for many, many animals, including the migratory dugongs. Isn't, uh, isn't he adorable? <laughs> now, unfortunately, the dugongs are listed as vulnerable, so the idea is, let's see if we can use machine learning to predict where seagrass habitats exist around the Australian coast, and in working to uh, preserve that habitat, uh, we can try to give these guys a better chance of survival. So as you remember before, uh, part one is all about creating your training data set. We have a set of ocean measurements that are taken from satellite data. This is a global set of data, uh, showing values for dissolved oxygen, temperature, salinity, as well as other metrics. We also have a polygon map of seagrass occurrences around the continental United States. So to create our training data set, we're going to be combining these two sets of information for random point locations around the coast of the U US. So each of those point features will have all of our ocean measurement data at that point, as well as whether seagrass grows there or not. Now that our training data set is created, we move on to phase two, which is training the model itself. As you can see, we're now outside of an ArcGIS environment and we're in a Python environment. We use the scikit-learn library to run a random forest classifier and we'll export the trained model definition for use in the final phase. Finally, we've reached phase three. Uh, we'll run our trained model against our global set of ocean measurements and we can see our inference results here. So each of those points is where the machine is predicting or estimating seagrass to grow based on the behavior that it observed for seagrass around the coast of the US. We can convert these points to raster and we can better visualize our results. So we can see there definitely seems to be a bit of a correlation between where the machine is predicting seagrass to grow most densely, particularly around the northern coast of Australia, and where the known habitat of the migratory dugongs is known to be. I'm gonna hand it over to Josh to talk about another application of machine learning, which is clustering. Over to you, Josh. Thanks. So clustering for me is probably one of the best examples I can think of of where a machine, a computer, is likely to do better than me as a human. Um, what I can do with my eye in terms of discerning clusters of phenomenon, clusters of observations versus noise is very limited. Um, I can convince myself I'm doing a good job because it looks like I'm seeing clusters, but are they Statistically significant clusters, almost certainly not. It's just a very kind of or a visceral impression of what I'm looking at. So the tools that exist already in ArcGIS to do that scientifically are really powerful and they kind of fall into three categories. The first, analyzing patterns, has its own tool set and they're designed to determine the degree of clustering, if any, uh, that's evident in the data and typically returns some kind of metric or measure of that degree of clustering. And then there's a category of tool that will actually allow you to visualize the clustering to start to make sense of, of literally what you're looking at in a again, in a scientific way. And then finally, a group of tools that introduce the temporal aspect to clustering, so actually looking at uh, observation clustering uh, in space and over time. And I want to show you an example of one tool which is looks very simple, but actually uses quite a lot of unsupervised machine learning in the background. And that's this density-based clustering tool. Um, its purpose in life is simple. It's there to separate statistically significant clustering from noise. Uh, so let me show you that in an action, and uh, hopefully you'll see what I mean. So my starting point here is around about 12,000 accident locations in Victoria last year. And from this data, as a point data set, what can you conclude? The accidents happen on roads, and they probably happen more often at intersections. Uh, so what I want to use is that density-based clustering tool to make more sense of the data. So I'm going to point it at that point feature class, which at the moment doesn't tell me very much. And of the three options that the tool offers me, I'm going to use this HDB scan approach, which is, I'm choosing because it's the most autonomous, the one that uses the most unsupervised capability. And the only input that needs is some indication of how many observations uh, represent a cluster. 
I run the tool, and it's fast enough to run pretty, pretty uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that would let you do it multiple times to experiment. And already I can see the gray points of the noise and the colored areas are clusters. Don't read anything into the color itself. But I can also use this chart that the tool generates to help me make sense of what the most significant clusters were. And in this case, this higher bar takes me to a part of the map that my eye just wouldn't have picked when I looked at the points. And that's this most significant cluster down in Geelong. Um, I just wouldn't have concluded that uh, without the tool helping me get there. So I think a really simple example of, of machine learning manifest in ArcGIS today. Back to you, Huta. Thanks, Josh. Let's talk about a totally different concept, classification. The concept of classification is all about detecting objects and then deciding which category they should belong to. Classification is most commonly used when analyzing imagery or other remotely sensed GIS data. Some examples of classification using imagery include identifying areas of forest loss or assessing vegetation health or even determining which buildings were damaged or not after a natural disaster. One of the techniques that's used in classification of imagery is called the single shot detector or SSD for short. This method maps out each image using a grid and then tries to fit these things called bounding boxes of different shapes and sizes and zoom levels around the, the grid in order to detect objects. Okay, everyone is still following? We all know what SSD is? Fantastic. Let's do a practical example. So our demonstration today is driven by Brimbank City Council in Victoria, Australia. Brimbank is located just to the northwest of the city of Melbourne and has a population close to 200,000 people. It's a vibrant community that's well known for its art installations, green spaces, and rich cultural history. Brimbank City also manages multiple car parks, and they're interested in knowing the occupancy rates for the car parks surrounding the Water Gardens Shopping Center. It's a major activity center for the city. So what Brimbank did is they supplied us with high-resolution aerial imagery of the area around uh, the car park, and being the forward-thinking council that they are, they'd also publish their car park boundaries and capacity information directly as open data to data.gov.au, and that's really all we need to get started with. So I started to run the machine learning workflow on my laptop and hit this error. It turns out my machine specs weren't quite up to snuff. I didn't have enough GPU RAM in order to train the model. So instead of running out to JB Hi-Fi and buying a new gaming laptop, I decided to look to the clouds for a solution instead. I provisioned an NC6 machine uh, from Azure. It's one of their GPU-optimized machines. Now, it's good to point out that you don't have to use Azure if you don't want to. AWS, uh, Google Cloud, pretty much any cloud provider has similar GPU-optimized offerings. So now that we've provisioned our machine, we can start to run through our workflow. So the first thing I did is I loaded in Brimbank's aerial imagery into ArcGIS Pro. And zooming in, we can see that it's quite a high quality level of imagery. We can definitely pick out the cars in our car park. Next, I used the Training Samples Manager tool and created a new schema for the training samples that we're about to create. Within that schema, I created a new class called Cars and chose the patented machine learning red color for that. After selecting cars, I used the polygon selection tool, and then I started to pick out individual samples of cars within my parking lot, within my car park. So what I'm doing here is I'm telling the machine, this is an example of what a car looks like. Here's another example of what a car looks like. Now, you might have noticed that we're zoomed in to a small section of the, uh, the Water Gardens car park. And there's a good rule of thumb when it comes to machine learning. It's that you can never have enough training samples. So after selecting all the cars in this section of the car park, you can see I zoomed out and picked out other small sections in other parts of the car park and created training samples there as well. In this way, we have examples of cars facing north-south, cars facing east-west, and everything in between. We have red cars, blue cars, so on and so forth. So by doing this, we're going to try to give our, uh, our algorithm the best chance of success. After that, uh, we use a geoprocessing tool called Export Training Data for Deep Learning. It's a pretty straightforward tool. It's all in the name, really. And we point it to these samples of cars that we've picked out. And the output of this tool is a folder of what are called image chips. So each of these little JPEG uh, files is essentially a cutting of our imagery. 
And the files that support these JPEG files uh, indicate whether a car was labeled to exist in that particular image chip and where it was located. And this is it, this is our training sample. We can move on to phase two. Now all of the code that I'm going to show you here, this Python code, you can run it in a script, but in order to make things more visual, we're using a Jupyter notebook so we can run through things line by line. So the first thing I did is uh, from the ArcGIS.learn library, I've imported the single shot detector module. And we're pointing our code to the image chips folder that we created earlier. And here we can see some of the sample outputs from that image chip. So some of those cars are labeled as car with little bounding boxes. Next, we start to define the parameters for our SSD, our single shot detector. We're giving it the number of grids that it's supposed to use, the zoom levels. And then we use our training data to find the learning rate for our machine learning. Putting all of that together, we can train our actual model, and we can see some of the sample inference results within our code here. So the left-hand side is what we fed in as image chips, and the right-hand side are some of the cars that it was able to pick out using the code that it trained. And the output of all of this is a series of files, including an EMD file, an Esri model definition file. So this EMD file, along with its supporting files, are what we're going to be exporting back into our um, ArcGIS environment as phase three. This is our train model. So now we're back in ArcGIS Pro, and this time we're using a geoprocessing tool called Detect Objects Using Deep Learning, and we point that tool to our Esri model definition file, our EMD file. After running the tool, we can see the output is a series of polygons for where the machine is predicting cars to exist in our imagery. You can see it's pretty good, but it's not perfect. It definitely misses some cars sometimes, and it counts other cars twice. Now, in order for us to get our accuracy up, the accuracy and the efficacy of our trained model up, we need to tweak our parameters in the single shot detector or perhaps run the training over more iterations so we can have a better model. But the great thing is you can see it's picked out the cars across the entire set of imagery. Now, Brimbank City Council wanted to know the, um, the occupancy rate for the car park, so in order to do that, we took the, um, the polygons and converted them to point features and then we brought in the car park's boundary layer uh, that we mentioned earlier, uh, which has our car park names and the capacity for each car park, which is the total number of bays. And combining those pieces of information together, we end up with polygons like this. So each of those polygons states what the name of the car park is, what the capacity of the car park is, the total number of cars that we were able to count using our machine learning algorithm, and we finally end up with the occupancy rate as a percentage. So that first car park has an occupancy rate of 54% at that point in time, and the second one has an occupancy rate of 63%. And this is what Burnbank City Council was looking for. They wanted a quick snapshot point in time occupancy rate for their car parks. So the workflow that we've just explored is great for just that. It's fantastic for proofs of concept and one-off ob observations. But what if we require more frequent results? What if we want more timely results? Well, the traffic engineering department in Brimbank City Council is looking at tackling this issue uh, using drones. They're exploring the possibilities around using drone technology with deep learning technology to do time-based comparisons of the utilization rates of their car parks. So th that's some uh, sample drone imagery from one of the car, car parks in Brimbank taken at 11 a.m. and then again taken at 1 p.m. on the same day. Now, if we wanted to support this kind of approach using ArcGIS and machine learning, uh, we need to modify our workflow slightly. So we'll keep the first two steps just as they were before. We'll pull in our uh, sample drone imagery this time into ArcGIS Pro and use it to create our uh, little training samples, our image chips. And we'll pull that into a Python environment. Maybe this time around we'll use Tensor, uh, TensorFlow to define a model. And then we end up with that model definition just like before. But now, we're going to set up a data pipeline. So whenever the traffic engineers at Brimback come back with new drone imagery, that drone imagery is automatically fed into an ArcGIS image server. And then we're gonna use the inferencing tools, the geoprocessing tools within image server in conjunction with the model that we trained earlier to perform our inferencing and then push the results directly out to portal. And then once the results are in portal, you can use them in your favorite uh, data um, data product, like a web map, web app, or even use it as part of a larger data analysis workflow. Now, 
if you remember, the training of the model is the most computationally intensive and the most technically difficult portion. So for you to be able to make machine learning work within your organization, for you to make it cost effective and make it repeatable, you want to train your model once. Train it once, train it well, and use it to inference results multiple times. So we'll train our model once, and then whenever we have new drone imagery coming in, we don't need to retrain the model again. We'll just apply the same model to the new imagery. Train once, inference multiple times. Okay, I'm gonna hand it off to Josh to talk about integrations. Thank you. So key to what Hutan just showed you is the notion of IHIS playing nice with the broader scientific Python ecosystem and data science frameworks in general. And I think Python's always been a good story from an Esri perspective, uh, but I wanted to talk about another aspect of this, which is the world of R, RStudio, Shiny, and all that kind of environment, which is arguably uh, equally, if not more, heavily used in the data science world. And Esri have a solution that allows you to get the best out of both worlds, and I wanted to just bring that to your attention. So my starting point this time is tens of thousands of crime locations uh, in the city of San Francisco. And my first analytical step is to simply aggregate those into hex bins and remove areas where there's no population, no crime. Um, so simple aggregate by count, and then I followed it up with a emerging hotspot analysis which would give you one view of crime in the city. But I actually want to look at crime rate. And I know that in R, there's an eBay's package, which has an empirical Bayes um, algorithm that I want to use. So back in R Studio, I load up ArcGIS binding, the R bridge, and I, get, I grab a license, which lets me talk to ArcGIS. And then I reach into my project in ArcGIS and bring the data in a feature class across into R. There, I turn it into a spatial data frame, so you can see the polygons there that represent the hex bins. And my next step is to do a bit of data wrangling to add a column to accept the result of the crime rate. And then I actually run this eBay's algorithm to generate my value for each hex bin of the crime rate. When I'm done with that, I push it into the column I created in the data frame and then push the data back into ArcGIS. So I've done where I, I've done the job of the crime rate calculation where I thought it was best done in R. If I refresh my view of the data now, you can see the feature class that was just a data frame is now a feature class. And if I look at one of those hex bins now, you can see that new column that was added in R showing the, uh, the crime rate. So my final analytical step, which I want to do back in ArcGIS, because that's the best place to do it, is to run the emerging hotspot analysis again so I can get that perspective of crime trend in the city based on the rate, not just the number of crimes. And it does end up painting a different picture. And I, I guess that's part of the point of doing this, but the main point was to illustrate that if I'm aware of capability uh, in another environment, um, let's go use it. Let's not be restricted to what I can do in ArcGIS. Back to you. Wow, so um, that was quite a lot of material to digest, but uh, before we wrap up, let's talk about some of what's coming next for deep learning in ArcGIS. So as you remember, um, that middle portion of our workflow, that was the most computationally intensive part, well, there's soon going to be a model of, or rather, there's soon going to be a library of ready-to-use models for the most common object detection use cases made available to you. So think about uh, detecting pools in backyards or detecting solar panels on roofs. Additionally, there are also going to be new model training geoprocessing tools built directly into ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Enterprise. So instead of starting out in an ArcGIS environment and then switching over to Python and then back into ArcGIS, you'll be able to do the entire machine learning workflow from beginning to the end without leaving the ArcGIS environment. And finally, deep learning capabilities are coming to mobility applications like Collector, which is really quite exciting because it would allow for deep learning enabled data collection workflows in the field in the future. All right, over to you, Josh. So thanks for spending your time with us. I hope it's stimulated some thinking around the possibilities here, but a word of caution, whilst machine learning is exciting and it's definitely a very popular and emerging uh, thing that's being talked about in the press and in our world, it's not a panacea for all analytical problems. 
you know, you've really got to have the kind of problem that it lends itself to before you embark on it, or uh, it could be a time-consuming folly. Don't underestimate what you can do in ArcGIS geoprocessing already. Think about all the options, uh, not just this kind of Python ArcGIS hybrid. Um, hope you enjoyed the session. Thanks very much. <laughs>